Testing. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, guess we're good. Man. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Fourth of July. I believe we can say that with a, without it being a political statement. It is just Happy Fourth of July. <laughs> yeah, amen. Uh, so, I, I don't know if your neighborhood was like mine last night. I think people saw that the fireworks were not going to happen in town, so they went out and bought as many as they could and blew up the neighborhood. It was quite impressive to see. I didn't have to go anywhere. I sat right there in our front lawn and watched many different sides of me going off. And it was, it was actually was kind of neat for a while, and then it got a little overbearing. <laughs> but uh, happy Fourth of July, everyone. It is good to be here, though. I'm glad to see the people that are here. I'm glad you are tuning in out there where you are, in your house, or wherever you are. Maybe you're outside of your house. It's a great thing about this is you can, you can join in and, and be where you are and... Uh, Take rest, take peace, and center yourself back on the Lord. That's what we're here to do, center ourselves back on the Lord. Let's go to the Word. From Psalm 33, 
Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, where else can our hope go but in you? You are our shepherd. You are our guide, Lord. Lord God, help us to seek you out as we get confused, as we get scared, as we find ourselves wondering and, and pondering things. Lord, may we seek you out for guidance, for your help, for your lead. Be near to us. Bless this time together, Father God. Bless each person that is listening, that is tuning in out there, those that are here in the sanctuary. Touch their hearts, their minds with your Holy Spirit. Be with Jerry as he brings forth the word. Bring with the worship team as they lead us in song. May everything in this place praise you, lift you up, and give you honor and glory. We pray all these things in your Son's name, Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.
for all that you've done for me.
Thank you. Thank you. The reckless love of God. Good morning. I am so thankful that you chose to worship here. Thank you to those of you who have chosen to join us virtually. May God unite our two congregations. Amen. And may he soon heal this land so we can all get back to being the church. How about it? Uh, yes, it is our prayer time, a joyful time in our service to be able to take our needs to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, Kathy Mills has reached out to me and asked that we continue to remember Don in our prayers, and we certainly will do that. Good morning, Don and Kathy, and we are praying that God will touch your life. I know that there are other needs that you have. Bob asked us to continue to pray for Valentina. It's good to see Bobby's doing better, right, Bob? Got himself into a nest of bees yesterday. I don't know what's wrong with him, but, you know, he's here this morning, so we're glad for that. I'm thankful that you made the choice. If you are in the room and you have a need in your life, we are not currently doing the anointing as we, as we do, but if you have a need, you may wish to stand. And in that standing, you're saying to the Lord, I have a need, Lord, and I'm asking you to touch my life. So as we pray together, if you've come into this place and you have a need for God's touch, you stand. Father... I look to you this morning, we look to you this morning with thanksgiving, first of all. Thankful that you are a good, good Father. That your love is beyond extravagant for us. Thank you, Lord, that we've had the opportunity to worship this morning, to turn our, our hearts and minds to higher things, to reflect on your goodness, to pause. Lord, I pray that this pause in our lives would be a moment of renewal and reset. I pray, Lord, for the friends that are standing this morning in this room, perhaps some standing in their living rooms today, asking, Lord, that their very little but significant act of faith would be seen in heaven, that you would respond to their needs, that you would bring hope and healing and restoration and provision, all those things that we look to you as our Father to provide. Lord, we pray for Don Mills this morning. Ask that you would touch his life. Pray that you would be with him and Kathy and you would lift him up. We pray for Valentina back. Lord, ask that you would be with her. We pray that you would strengthen her and Bob. Lord, we do ask for those needs that we're unaware of in this congregation that have been shared, Lord, with your heart. Move, we pray, upon those lives. Lord, we pray for our digital VBS that's scheduled in a, a month or so and ask, Lord, that as those recordings are made and as they're published as children watch those online that somehow your spirit would use this medium to be able to touch their lives with the love of Jesus Christ that little lives would be influenced Lord with your kingdom that decisions would be made to follow you and make you Lord of life Lord on this weekend when we are remembering the birth of this nation we pray once again for our land we pray for our nation we pray for those who lead us, Lord, that you would somehow touch their hearts and minds, that you would lift them up above themselves in narrow party interests, Lord, in partisan politics, that you would give us people who are concerned for the wealth and the health of the nation, that they would lead for us all, Lord. We pray for those who are suffering, Lord, in this time of transition and change socially, and ask that you would give us great understanding and compassion for one another and a willingness to engage, Lord, in the hard processes of change, that each one of us would examine the own attitudes of our hearts. Lord, I pray that your church would be at the forefront of justice, that we would be people of God who live for the purposes of God, that the glory of God would be seen in our world. In all this, Jesus, we pray in your holy name. And God's people said... Would you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And God's people said, Amen. For I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
He descended to the dead. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into the heavens and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in Christ's universal church, the communion of all believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And I am a... Hallelujah. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Exchange your greeting with someone in the sanctuary, the holy wave, the Pentecostal blessing. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, good morning. We are glad to see you this morning. We can pretend that we're seeing you out there in your homes, and we're glad that you're with us as well as with us in the church building. So just a few announcements. I can't tell what's up there. That's up there. Okay, we are starting to film our virtual VBS this week, so as Pastor Jerry mentioned, you can be praying for those people. It's a little awkward to talk to kids through a screen, as you might imagine. It's way more fun to have them right in front of you. So you can um, pray for our energy and our enthusiasm, and mostly that um, the gospel goes out very clearly from this building out into our community. So we are preparing... Um, for about a hundred cargo packs to give out the week before VBS. Right now we have 42 kids signed up for that, so you can spread the word. If we need to make more, we will try to make more. Um, kids can sign up on our website, and on August 1st we'll be giving out those things to make VBS extra special. But as always, being it's online, um, you can watch it that week or you can watch it anytime. So don't feel like if you're on vacation that week, you're going to miss it. You won't miss it. Um, you can watch it at any time on um, YouTube or on the Facebook. Um, just scroll back during the week. Okay, and we're going to talk about giving, but also another announcement. Um, the food pantry is hosting their rummage sale this Saturday. That's from 9 until 2. Um, We'll be wearing masks, social distance, the whole deal. Um, but if you would like to come shop at the rummage sale, all of the proceeds um, go to the food pantry ministry here at Faith Discovery. So you are in, invited to do that. And thank you again for your continued giving. Um, if you haven't tried out the Tithely app yet, you can sign up for that. It makes it really easy um, to give online if you're not here. Um, and as always, you can send your tithes or your offerings um, right to the church office. Or if you're here, there's places in the hallway to give. So thank you for your continued support um, to make these ministries possible to have the um, gospel go out from this place into our community. So thank you again.
and Olivia and Mike and Ralph and Dave. Amen? And thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you for leading us. Let's pray as we prepare to open the Word. Lord, we are now encountering the Holy Scripture. We pray that it will encounter us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would cause the preaching of the word to become a sacrament of grace, a means of knowing your presence, hearing your voice. Help this preacher, Lord, to be enabled to be more than a speaker. Help me to reflect the anointing, the power of your spirit. And I pray that you would touch the ears of the hearers, Lord, both those who are virtual this morning, those who are in this room, that your word would accomplish the purposes for which you have sent it. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, We have been talking about being renewed and restored. <clears throat> what an apt subject. Amen? If you want to read with me, Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now, it's a great thing you have those masks on. I can't tell who's reading and who's not reading, so I can't pick on anybody. <laughs> Ah, so we're going to talk this morning about faithlessness. Faithlessness, but we're going to turn it around, obviously, restoration and renewal. We'll talk about faithfulness in a few moments. Anybody besides me in this room find themselves working hard to remain faithful and thankful and obedient in these days? Yeah, good. I'm not alone then. I've got, I've got an audience. How about you out there? So... In the interest of transparency, I need to tell you, and I started this way last week too, but I want to tell you again. In the interest of transparency, I can admit that it takes me all of about five seconds to go from zero to 60 emotionally. I can go from, thank you Jesus for all my blessings, to what's the matter with this crazy world, in five seconds or less. How about you? 
Yep, anybody find yourself like that? It's kind of that way. Nerves are on edge, emotions are jangled, and the problems are real. Many of the things happening around us defy understanding, but that's no excuse, my friends, to gripe and complain. I want to take you this morning to the 13th and 14th chapters of Numbers to explore an ancient story in, from Israel's history that shows the effect of faith and faithlessness. You know the story of the Exodus, right? You know the story. The people were led out miraculously from Egypt. They were led by the hand of God. They were fed every day with manna from heaven. They knew the constant presence of the Lord. The book, uh, the book of Exodus tells us as well as numbers in the pillar of cloud by day and the fire at night. And yet, as we're going to see, they somehow managed to doubt God on a fairly regular basis. Yes. Moses had been hard at work during this time of shaping the people. He had would been forming over a year's time these former slaves in Egypt who had been there for four centuries into a nation. He had been giving them God's law. He had been building the tabernacle for their worship. He had been creating a priesthood all under the guidance of God. And now we find them about, and as we begin our story, we find them about a year from leaving Egypt and they are at the border of the promised land, at the border of Canaan. And we're going to see what happened. Now, some of you might be saying, why are we studying an old story, Pastor? It's 4,000 years old. Who cares? Here's what the New Testament tells us about that. So the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of the testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years, saw what I did. In other words... He says that we need to make sure that we don't fail in faith because he says, I was angry with that generation and I said, their hearts are always going astray. They've known my, not known my ways and so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. They're not going to go into the promised land. So see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Nobody in this church does, but in some churches they doubt God. Hmm... <laughs> yeah. And then he fin the passage finishes up this way in Hebrews. But, read the words with me, encourage one another daily. Let's do it again. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called a day, as long as it's the present, so that you will not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We're going to go over to the, our story in Numbers, and we begin in the 13th chapter. I'm going to read you a list of names as we begin. Let's see how we do with all these names. I'm sure I won't do too well because my Hebrew is pretty lousy. Yeah, Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe send one of its leaders. And so the Lord command, so the Lord's command, at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. And these are their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, the son of Zakur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hore. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palte, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Manasseh, a tribe of Joseph, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamiel. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Boshi. From the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Maki. How did I do? Do you think so? Well, you wouldn't know. You probably wouldn't do any better. <laughs> I read that list of names because as you are looking through that name of supposed leaders, I think that you probably noticed that you didn't recognize many of those names as any significance. And there's going to be a reason for that as we go through it. But two of the names, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, probably stood out to you. 
These men were sent on a commission to, of reconnaissance, and these, there are only two memorable heroes in that list, Caleb and Joshua. You, you heard me read the name Hoshea. Hoshea in Hebrew, in Hebrew means salvation. And a little bit after this time, Moses changed, changed Hoshea's name to a variant of that called Joshua, which means he went from saying, your name is salvation, to God is my salvation. So that, that's a little bit of a shift there. But there is a reason that we see these two men as being significant over the others, which we're going to discover. But the primary reason is because they were men of faith. In, Je in Numbers 14, verse 24, we read this. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his inheritance will descend it. Let me read, will, will inherit it. Let me read to you from the New Living. My servant Caleb has a different attitude from the others. Ten of those young men, and they were the cream of the crop, they were leaders in Israel, disappeared into obscurity. Two of them went on to great fame. Caleb and Joshua, because they are for us examples of steadfast faith. Let me continue with the story. Verse 16. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hoshea, the son of Nun, the name Joshua. There you go. Told you that. And when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev into the hill country and see what the land is like, whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they walled or unwalled or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do, you best to, do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes, probably late June, early July. And so they went up and they explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Libo Hamath and they went through the Negev and they came to Hebron where Ahiman, Shishai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And when they reached the valley of Eshkol they cut off a branch bearing a single, single cluster of grapes and two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs and that place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes that the Israelites cut off there. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. An important mission of preparation. It was, a land, it was to find out what they were going to encounter. They were going to obviously deal with conflict as they're dispossessing a people who were settled in the land to take it for themselves. So Moses, wisely under the commission of God, says to these these leaders of Israel, I want you to go and I want you to travel the breadth of the land. And they did. If you, I read the geography, it probably meant nothing to you. But literally they went from the south, they went up through the Jordan River Valley all the way to the top, up above where we would call Galilee from the time of Jesus, the foot of Mount Hermon, and circled back down. And then they picked the grapes in the Valley of Eshkol and returned once again to the people. And what they saw was a land of plenty, a land of amazing opportunity. They cut the samples, they came back. What would they report? How would they encourage Israel to follow God's lead, to trust God? Well, let's take a look. Numbers 13, verse 26. And they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. And along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we certainly can do it. But the men who had gone with him said, We cannot attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it 
all the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim, which are the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. <laughs> A dozen men enter the land, have exactly the same experience, and come to completely different conclusions. How very human. <laughs> How many of you had that experience of having the same experience with somebody else and you hear them tell the story and you tell the story and you say, where in the world have they been? What did they see that I didn't see? Yeah. I know it's an aside. Any of you ever attend a funeral and the preacher waxes eloquently about the person that's in the coffin and you say, who in the world's in that coffin? I must have got to the wrong funeral. Now oh, you wouldn't admit it, but it happens, right? Anyway, there was a different report. A completely different report. Ten of them saw inevitable defeat and death if the invasion were attempted, and two of them saw opportunity. What made the difference? Why did they feel differently? There's one key difference, which is the heart of my message this morning, and I believe it's the heart of the message of this passage, and that is faith informed the perspective of the two. Now let's say something that's important right here. Faith does not ask us to ignore the reality of the world around us. How many of you have ever had to deal with a Christian who is completely in la-la land and they're claiming it's faith? They won't deal with the reality. They won't deal with what's going on. I had a wonderful friend when I was a young man. His name was Tom and Tom loved the Lord. I I have known few Christians like Tom in the sense of his sacrificial service of the Lord, the depth of his worship, but Tom had an irritating habit. Tom refused to acknowledge any difficulties, any problems in life. I took a trip one day with Tom, and he is sitting on the other side of the car, and he is sneezing and blowing his nose and coughing, and I said, Tom, why are we in this car together? You are sick. Praise Jesus, I'm not sick. I said, you're sneezing and you're, sne and you're blowing your nose and you're coughing. I confess in Jesus' name I'm whole. I said, I don't care what you confess, you're sick, dog. Yeah, that's, that's silly to ignore the realities. Now, could Jesus heal him? Yes, I said, I was happy to pray with him for healing. But faith doesn't ask us to say, I don't see what's going on. I rewrite reality. I ignore what's going on. That, that is a silly thing. God doesn't ask that faith ignores reality, but he does invite us to see the world with faith that develops trust in him in every circumstance. Amen? Hebrews 11.6 says, without, without, it is impossible to please God for those who would come to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. The Bible says that there was a different attitude in Caleb. A different spirit. What was it? He was full of faith. He saw things differently. Is your mind formed by faith? Is your vision shaped by the promise of God? That is a key question that I ask you this morning. It's a critically important question in this particular time. It is. This can be a difficult time to keep faith. The COVID virus continues to plague us. Infection rates, if you can believe the media, and I don't believe much of it, is on the rise again. We are facing, again, a society that is torn, a society divided by wealth and economics and political persuasion, and, if you, again, if you can believe all of the media, largely divided by race. Anger boils over in so many places in our country. I mean, I saw two videos this week of people who blew up in grocery stores because they were asked to wear a mask. Come on, folks. It's a mask. You know, I saw one lady take her cart in a store in a Trader Joe's, and she threw the contents of her cart all over the store because they asked her to put a mask on. I thought, that lady needs some help. How about it? We see ordinary people 
reacting with anger because of the pressures and the emotions. We see protesters on the street who have a cause and who we need to hear in anger boiling over and some of those, press process, uh, those protests turning into destructive uh, acts of, on property and violent acts, which is a tragic thing. We see ordinary people in, our, in their living rooms reacting to scenes on the screen that confound their understanding and they get mad. I know, I'm one of them. That's why I tell you every week and I'll tell you again, turn off your television. Turn off your television. But we who are people of faith can choose to be different. This is not just a self-help message. This just isn't about a little bit better emotional health for you. It matters to God, friend. It matters to God. If you are a person who complains constantly, you become toxic to any group of which you're a part, including God's church. Despair and doubt draws the gaze of people away from God and His sufficiency. Those ten men who came back and gave, gave a negative report, they started off accurately. They said, it's going to be difficult because the people there are taller than we are. Actually, they exaggerated. They said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. That means like the people would have had to have been 40 feet tall. And we know that wasn't true. But they exaggerated, but they saw reality, and then they went over the brink. And I don't think they had any idea what was going to happen as a result of the negative report. But we don't have time to read the story. But if you read it this morning, you will see that those ten men who gave a negative report actually turned the whole heart of the nation. Hmm. And the rebellion, a rebellion broke out against Moses, a rebellion that turned murderous. Pretty soon the people went beyond saying, hey, we just need to choose a new leader. We need to kill Moses. And the only thing that saved Moses is the presence of God came down and divided the people from Moses. And God drew Moses back into the tent of worship. And Moses went there and he prayed and he interceded for the people. By the way, can you see how idiotic those, that nation was? They were carried away by the negativism of the report, so much so that they said, we will return to Egypt and become slaves again. We'll give away our heritage and we'll become slaves again. That's how badly fear affected their lives. Listen to passages from Scripture about the power of your words. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Jesus said, I tell you that you will give account on the day of judgment for every careless word you have spoken. That ought to sober your heart. Proverbs 18, 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. What are you dealing every day? Are you dealing life or are you dealing death? James chapter 3 verse 5 says, The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. It sets a fire. It's like a fire. Are you building faith or are you sowing seeds of fear and panic these days? Here's God's directive, Ephesians 4.29 for the people of God. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Can I paraphrase that for 2020? Do not put ugly, nasty things on your Facebook news feed. Hmm. I didn't hear any amens. Speak, speak that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Largely, our nation is panicked today because so many people are crying that there are giants in the land, that things are going from bad to worse, that all hell is breaking out and there's no hope. And it's all not true. Do we have difficulties? Yes. Do we have challenges? Absolutely, yes. Must we change as a society? Yes. Absolutely, we must change. But the church, who has a hope in Jesus Christ, can take the lead because we are people whose hope is not rooted in our health or in our wealth or even in our relationships. Our hope is rooted in our relationship with God, and that is eternal. Amen. So how do we overcome that fear? 
Well, the most common command in the Bible, believe it or not, is fear not. In one form or another, that directive shows up at least 365 times in the Bible. And I think that's just kind of fun. One for every day. That's what a bunch of nervous Nellies we are. 365 times, one way or the other. Fear not. For example, when the angel came to Mary and said, you are going to bear a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, what was the first thing she heard? Fear not. Don't be afraid. When Jesus was telling the disciples about the difficulties they were going to face as they went out to build his kingdom, he said, don't fear those who kill the body. Don't fear those who could take your life, but rather fear God who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Moses, as he was preparing to hand over the leadership to Joshua about 40 years after the incident we read this morning, Moses says this to the people of Israel, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of those who live in the land. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Paul, writing to a young pastor named Timothy, encouraged that young pastor to boldness. And he says to Timothy, you're familiar with 2 Timothy chapter 1, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God that's in you, which came on you by the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Why does God say this so often to us? Why does he say it so often in his word? Because if we see the world around us only with natural eyes, we will be freaked out. Amen? Because here is the reality. Life is dangerous. It's full of all kinds of things that can go wrong. How many of you know that? Yeah. I know that. You know? Six years ago, my life was hunky-dory and wonderful. I had four great kids. I had a wonderful wife. And everything was wonderful. And on March 22nd of 2014, the doctor looked at my beautiful, otherwise healthy wife and said, you have an advanced case of ovarian cancer. I went home and researched it and realized that unless God gave us a miracle, within two years I would be a widower and I was in 20 months. Hmm. Initially I got freaked out. Things are going to come into your life that are going to freak you out. This world we live in, you may be freaked out, and I'm using that term, and, but you may be freaked out by the things that you are going through right now. And so we need to pray that God would put a different spirit in us, a different attitude, like that of Caleb, one that follows the Lord wholeheartedly. I'm going to go a little late this morning. It's already 11 o'clock. Hang with me. The most common mental health issue in America this morning and in, for the last two decades is anxiety. Did you know that? <laughs> About one in five Americans deal with anxiety at such a level that it causes physical symptoms and social difficulties in their life. In other words, people are freaked out. Now, don't misunderstand me. If you suffer from anxiety, I'm not condemning you. I'm not suggesting you're sinning. I'm not calling you a bad person. But I am telling you that through Christ you can find victory over fear for God never asks us to, the, to do the impossible without equipping us with all the resources we need. And God's people said, yes, it's true. So what does he say to us in Philippians chapter 4? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, read the next words with me, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yes, friend, it is true. If you're freaked out by life, if you're ready to give a negative report, if you're affecting the body of Christ with a toxic attitude of faithlessness, there are three things from that passage that tell us that faith grows, number one, when we change the input. 
Where do you go for your wisdom? Who do you believe? Whose report will you believe? When I was a kid in the Pentecostal church on Sunday night services, and I was going to try to break it out today, we used to sing an old gospel song, I believe the true report, hallelujah to the Lamb. Do you know that one, Tony? Yeah, it was a good song. Whose report are you believing? Are you keyed into CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and driving yourself into freaked out land, or are you going to believe the report of God that says, the word of truth feeds faith. You are my children. I have a plan for this world. I reign sovereign, and I am the Lord of it all. Is your mind bathed in the scripture? Are you stepping into the presence of God in worship often? Are you in prayer, contemplative prayer, letting God change the input? Number two, take control of your emotions. Contrary to what you are often taught in this contemporary society, you are much more than your feelings. People love their feelings, and so do I. I'm glad for emotions. Without emotions, we would be machines. Emotions make us warm. They make us human. They enrich our lives. But if you are in the grip of your emotions, if your emotions rule you, you will be a basket case of humanity. Because your emotions are fickle, and they go up and down, and they go all over the place. They get affected by things like a headache, or too little sleep at night, or too many people setting off fireworks in your neighborhood. I couldn't believe all the people on Facebook going nuts today because people were setting off fireworks last night. Get over it, people. Take a nap. You know? It's not the end of the world because your neighbor decided to shoot off a firework at 11.30. Would it make me happy? Not exactly, but I'd probably roll over and say, God bless him. God bless America. Take a nap. Take control of your emotions. You're more than your impulses. You're more than your ups and downs. God has given you the ability to exert control over the emotions. No, not that you become a stoic or a machine, but so that you understand that you have the ability to shape those things for God's sake. The weapons, Paul says, that we fight with are not weapons of this world. We have divine power to demolish strongholds. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You can do it. But will you? And it's not easy, by the way. And number three, most significantly, faith grows when we lean into Christ. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. We lean in to Christ. This week, when I found myself getting drawn into anger, when I found myself getting, getting drawn into being distressed about the state of the church, when I found myself getting angry at Governor Murphy for putting more restraints on people, I leaned into Jesus. I said, Jesus, I have got to trust you. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Lean into Jesus. When my wife's cancer diagnosis was handed down, I leaned into Jesus. I didn't lean into Jack Daniels. I didn't go get a prescription for anxiety. I leaned into Jesus. Every day I committed life to Jesus, life that was changing, my wife to Jesus, the circumstances of my life. Lean into Jesus, whatever it is, where he says we can take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Amen? These are challenging times. God has rest restoration. He has renewal. For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen? We're going to move to communion. Would you bow your heads with me? I've asked Dave to play a verse of that beautiful song that's been circulating recently called The Blessing. And as he does, as we close this service, those of you who are watching virtually, I ask all of you to lean into Jesus this morning. I know I've been a little bit lighthearted, but in, in these closing moments of this time, take those things that concern you, make a little package of them, if you will, and lean into Jesus and say, Lord, I want you 
to encourage me. I want you to build faith, Lord. I, I don't want to be those ten people who disappeared into obscurity. I want to be Caleb and Joshua who continued as models of faith down through the ages. And in a moment, we'll go to the communion table. We'll celebrate the Lord's meal together. But take a moment to prepare your heart and to give your troubles to Jesus this morning as we close. Come you who are loved by the Lord. Come to the table of the Lord. Come, eat food with no cost. Come, drink with no money to pay. From Isaiah. Yes, we come to eat, to drink. Our hearts are glad. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that as we come to this table, that your great love will be shown to us. We thank you that your love does not abandon us in dark, fearful places. We thank you that in Jesus you came to us to rescue us, to restore us, to give us life. And now, Lord, we pray that we will enter in fully to worship in these holy moments. In the name of Jesus Christ. At the Passover meal before his crucifixion, Matthew tells us Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And so if you are taking communion this morning, I invite you to take that bread. And we're going to give thanks before we eat it. That bread is the remembrance of the body of Christ. That he was broken for us. That God became flesh. The unique God-man. God incarnate, we say. Fully man. That he might feed us with his presence. That he might make us whole. We thank you for your love shown us, Lord, in your incarnation. We ask that you would bless this bread to our bodies. That as we eat this bread that we will remember Jesus, your humanity, and that we will trust in you as our great high priest even now in the presence of the Father. In Jesus' name. Let's eat the bread together. Matthew continues saying that after supper he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered it to the disciples saying, Drink from it all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so we too take the cup and as we do we remember the great love of Jesus Christ. We remember that his life was offered so that we could live, that we could live forever. And my prayer is that as we share this cup in a moment, that God will write large in our hearts his love, his grace, his mercy, the covenant promise that he made to us by the blood of his Son. We thank you, Lord, for the cup. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice of your life. We thank you that you have declared us right with God, that you have given us your spirit as the testament that we enjoy eternal life even now. We drink this cup, Lord, remembering your covenant and ask that it would become a moment in which we worship you deeply, experiencing that covenant in a mystery of faith 
that only the Spirit can make possible in Jesus' name. Shall we drink the cup? Now, Lord, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for welcoming us to your table. Help us to remember that we are your children. Help us, Lord, to receive your life, walk in your strength, to follow your ways every moment of our lives. And may your caring arms embrace us and your comforting words fill us and the Spirit's renewing presence surround us today and always. We pray in your holy name. And God's people said, Amen. May God bless you and may he keep you. Thank you for being with us for worship today. Those of you who worship virtually, thank you for sharing the service with you. Have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you and we look forward to joining our hearts in worship with you next week. Face toward